and it is <coughs> Friday the 8th of January 2016 and the world has been saved by the Paris Climate uh, Agreements. Uh, getting a smile out of Kevin Anderson here. And we'll start with Paris. So you've, you've written uh, some very robust things. Uh, the, I'm thinking of what appeared in Nature, which I'll link to in the blog post that goes with this video. Okay. In a soundbite, if you can. The outcomes of Paris were... In terms of the headline message, they were very positive. That was a real triumph. And there were two parts to that. Firstly, that we actually have very strong agreement on a temperature thresholds, ones that I think are appropriate, at least 2 degrees centigrade. I'm, I'm less convinced by the 1.5, which I think effectively is a sop to the poorer parts of the world. And the second thing is that I think it sends a very clear message to the sceptic community that by and large, well not by and large, every single world leader has said that they think climate change is important. Now that, that is actually really a, a significant step forward. So those are the two really promising things that, co that com come out of Paris and we mustn't underestimate how, how valuable they are. Nevertheless, it's a 32 page document. The, 30, the other 31 pages are broadly uh, legal fluff. There is nothing in there that requires countries to deliver anything like the rates of mitigation that match the headline comments. Worse than that, I think that there's an underlying message that we're going to rely on what I've referred to as techno-utopias to resolve climate change some point several decades from now. So in, although it's got a very strong headline messages, it's then, in terms of action, it's just kicked that can down the street, um, passing that on to future generations. No change there then. So just for people who haven't seen the other video that we did before you went to Paris, can you quickly sum up what you mean by techno-utopia and, you know, maybe talk about Bex as well? Okay, yeah. Um, th there's a very clear message, which is not, and it's implicit, but it's very clear, within the, within the Paris Agreement, that we're going to have to rely on removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, sucking CO2 out of the air in the future, because we're not prepared to put uh, the necessary policies and technologies in place in the, in the near term to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions now. So we're going to carry on emitting carbon dioxide emissions at very little change from current rates and therefore we're going to exceed any of the carbon budgets to do with the headline temperatures of 2 degrees C and the, the only way out of that then is to assume that you can suck the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere normally 2040, 2050 on towards the end of the century at very large levels. And the, the way they intend to do this is to, they use something, the most common way that they discuss in it's not, I say it's not highlighted directly in, in, in the Paris Agreement, but all of the models that feed into the Paris Agreement, they by and large use one particular technology called BEX, Biomass Energy Carbon Capture and Storage. And this means that you, you grow um, bioenergy crops, now that could be trees, it could be particular types of grasses, but some, some plant material, and as it grows through photosynthesis, it absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. You then harvest that, you pelletize it or you convert it into a useful form to be able to, to be transported. You ship it all around the world, you take it in the trains to the power stations, you burn it in the power stations. As it burns, it will release the carbon dioxide again that will go up the, up the chimney, up the flue. You capture that carbon dioxide, or at least as much of it as you can. You almost liquefy it um, so in a sort of supercritical sense, and then you pump it through pipes a long way and you store it underground for a few millennia. So we're relying on that technology that you doesn't to exist. keep a straight face there, aren't well, you? <laughs> we're relying on that technology that currently doesn't exist and at a huge scale. So we're talking about planting areas between one and three times the area of India, planting it year after year after year for decade after decade to absorb the carbon dioxide that we continue to put in the atmosphere because we cannot not be bothered to um, to make changes to the way we live our lives today. The other big problem with this is that because we're not prepared to make those changes now and the carbon dioxide emissions continue to build up in the atmosphere, we have to keep our fingers crossed that the natural set of feedbacks that we may trigger from a rise in temperature will not occur. These feedbacks are the ones, the one that people often talk about, the permafrost and the, and the release of methane, mm -hmm. which is a very strong greenhouse gas. So you have to keep your fingers crossed that these natural feedbacks will not be triggered by our ongoing increases of carbon dioxide emissions and the ongoing rise in temperature. So I think at every level it is highly risky, highly speculative um, uh, approach and it underpins the Paris Agreement and yet there is no direct reference to it anywhere within the Paris Agreement but if anyone who understands the basic science of climate change and understands the basic numbers can, can discern that from just from reading the document. 
I'll confess I've not yet read the document, um, but I do know that aviation and <coughs> shipping aren't in there. So what? Now, it's interesting that because they were in there in the earlier texts. So when you're at Paris, what is interesting there is you see the suites of texts as they go through. So the first one comes in, it's quite bulky with lots and lots of brackets where countries have their different red lines of what you will and won't brackets. accept. Then you get the second one, and then you get the final text. And by the final text, all the brackets have gone and actually a lot of the, the strength of the document is also removed. Um, so what happened in the final document, though in the previous two versions it had been there, is that aviation and shipping emissions were excluded from the final text. Now, some people may say, well, does that really matter? Aviation and shipping emissions are the equivalent to adding the emissions from UK and Germany together. So it's two, you know, the emissions from equivalent of two large and important industrial nations. Um, worse than that is that the rate of growth of aviation and shipping emissions is, is anticipated to be very high, it has historically been very high, I mean, obviously a bit slower during the recent economic downturns and so forth, but historically it's always been usually much higher than the rates of growth of, of the economy, so the GDP growth rate is normally much lower than the growth rate we would see for aviation and shipping. Both the aviation and shipping industries are anticipating considerable growth, they're in, both anticipating considerable improvements in efficiency, but not enough to compensate for the growth, so both sectors see their emissions rising very significantly, sometimes doubling or tripling, by 2050. So if you think about that, if they're already the emissions of, AV, of, of the UK and Germany are thinking about equivalent of almost doubling our current emissions within a framework that's supposed to be aiming for 2 degrees centigrade and well or below. Five. Well, yeah, <laughs> well below 2 degrees C and aiming to pursue, uh, sorry, well, yeah, well below 2 degrees centigrade or um, pursuing um, 1.5. So the devil's advocate, the ICAO, the International <coughs> Civil Aviation Organization, is holding a big conference, I think, in September of this yeah. year. And isn't that the place where these issues can be hammered out, says devil's advocate? Um, well, if, if there was any history that they'd, been successfully, that they'd successfully done that, fine. But right back in the Kyoto Protocol, I mean, a long, long time ago, aviation and shipping were excluded from the, from the Kyoto Protocol with the understanding that they would come up, the ICAO and the IMO for shipping, the International Maritime Organization, they would come up with their own mechanisms for um, controlling the emissions from their sectors. Now that would be fine if they demonstrated some, um, you know, some ability to achieve that, but they've, they've both fundamentally failed to get any grasp of the emissions from those sectors. So I have no, no faith in either the IMO or ICAO in delivering the rates of reductions that would be necessary um, to be in line with 2 degrees centigrade. And actually when you look at the ICAO and the IMO documents as to what it is that they're going to achieve strategically, if they are successful, they're still um, far removed from what would be necessary for 2 degrees centigrade. Um, so, yeah, no, I don't have any hope that ICAO or IMO will put their, country, they'll put their um, sectors in line with 2 degrees C. Another absence from the document, um, fossil fuels. There's no reference to fossil fuels in the 32-page document. The There's best no trick the devil ever played yeah. was making people think he didn't exist. Yes, well, I mean, <laughs> that is a real concern. And that's been a, a wider concern than just Paris. Um, but there's also no, no reference to decarbonisation either. So that, that, I think this is a real, real concern to me, is that we couldn't get fossil fuels in there. Clearly, that, you know, fossil fuels are the principal um, culprit when we look at climate change, or at least our use of fossil fuels. Uh, the principal culprit, and yet we've managed to have a 32-page document about climate change that makes no reference to fossil fuels. Um, and my concern about that is that actually a lot of the language, a lot of the discussion that we've heard, quite you know, often very well-meaning language that we've heard in discussions, is around things like energy efficiency, and, and that's something I often talk about, and renewables, which I also um, promote. So energy efficiency, to me, is a hugely important issue. Nevertheless, these in themselves have nothing to do with climate change. The climate only cares about the amount of fossil fuels that we combust and carbon dioxide that goes in the atmosphere. So when we say we're going to increase the amount of renewables, unless it means that we're actually going to leave the fossil fuels in the ground, then it's irrelevant. And actually I think most of the discussion on renewables at the moment is really about in addition to the fossil fuels. It's not in substitution of the fossil fuels. And energy efficiency is not about reducing our use of fossil fuels. It's about making our use of them more efficient, which often means we then just consume more of them. So I think there are real concerns that we have not been prepared to, to um, be direct and clear that we have to keep the lion's share of current reserves of fossil fuels in the ground. The paper by Paul Eakins, well by Christopher McGl Christoph McGlade and Paul Eakins that came out in Nature Climate Change, I think it was earlier last year, that said about, so I think it was 70 to 80% of current reserves need to be kept in the ground. 
um, you know, that, that's an important Unburnable reminder. carbon. Unburnable carbon. But it's also worth bearing in mind, in that paper as well, there was an assumption, which you only find out if you talk to the authors, of 360 billion tonnes of, um, of BEX, of sucking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in the future. So if you remove that, you're talking much more of 85 to 90 percent of all current known reserves of fossil fuels would need to remain in the ground if we're going to stay well below 2 degrees centigrade. And yet, no reference to fossil fuels in the 32-page document. We come back to the UK. The UK government is enthusiastic about shale gas and, and DEC have just said that they want to support the oil and gas industry in the UK. There is no intention from an incredibly wealthy country like the UK with probably the world's best renewable potential, but also lots of fossil fuels. We have no intention of keeping the fossil fuels in the ground. So the, UA, the UK is emblematic of the complete absence of any real concern about climate change at the global level, despite oh, the Paris Agreement. No, 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 Australia. Australia surely is emblematic. Well, the Australians, of course, are just bricks that left here a little while ago. <laughs> I will pretend you didn't say that. Um, so, next question. Um, it's from Clive Hamilton, who's someone we both respect a lot. He's an Australian political scientist who's been working on climate change since mm. the very early 90s. Yes. You know, and has... Anyway... He's of the point of view that people who accentuate the lack of teeth in the Paris Agreement are missing the point, and that you need to look at the message it's sending to investors in energy infrastructure, and that there'll be a move away from coal to gas and renewables. And his take on the weakness of the Paris Agreement is, well, what did you expect? So if Clive were in the room, what would you be saying to him? If he was only given a very short time to answer, I would say honesty. And um, that's what I expected from the Paris Agreement. Now, or at least, yes, that's what I think. Really? Should, it's what the Paris Agreement should have delivered. And okay, those are two different things. Well, what, actually, there's not, a difference not quite. between what should happen and what you expect no, to happen. No, actually, I mean, I, um, I think that the it wouldn't have taken very much from where it was for it to become a much more viable document okay. if it had included carbon budgets. So you'd be it. talking about a, a percentage of parts per million target, for example. Well, it could be it could be that, but I would have preferred to use the carbon budget approach. Okay. So if it had said how much carbon dioxide we can emit for well below 2 degrees centigrade, then I think that would have provided us with a, without, you know, that would not have been a lot of additional, it would, would not be, you know, that's a huge inclusion to the document. The rest of the document could have been almost as it is. But if it had said we want to stay well below 2 degrees centigrade, and pursue aims at, pursue an aim of 1.5 degrees centigrade, and that is in line with the IPCC's carbon budgets of, and then we could have put the, t you know, the very simple table at the synthesis report in there. Then I think that would have given that would have provided a significant amount of sort of teeth, if you like, to use um, Clive's word, um, for people to go away to their to, to the national governments for, for countries to start thinking, well, what does that mean for us? But the, because there was no reference, really, there's hardly any reference to science in there. In fact, in the second um, draft science had been the term science had been removed from it in any meaningful sense, and that quite a number of us were were, were um, per perturbed by that. Let's say, um, and we we tried to argue very strongly that science should be included. And unfortunately, the final document, science, was included. So perhaps we can at least make some reference back to the IPCC. But I think Clive is missing the point there. Firstly, he's talking about moving to renewables and gas. Well, these have to be substitutes for the other fossil fuels. But also gas is not low carbon, so he's already picked up, taken on board the baton that's been handed to him to some degree. And I, I, mean, I think it's probably a little unfair to take him from one quote, but handed to him by the oil industry, who says that, well, we recognise the importance of moving to gas from coal. Now, I think most of us would recognise that's not because the oil companies are particularly concerned about climate change. They can see a very large profit in gas, yes. and they want to carry on business as usual. You know, gas is still very high carbon emissions. 75% of the mass of natural gas is carbon. When you burn it, you get a lot of carbon dioxide. And if there are any leaks in the, in the process of getting it out of the ground, which they inevitably always will be, then you're releasing methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. Yeah. So gas is not a clean alternative to coal. It's just not quite as bad as coal. So I think that, again, Clive has been a bit... Well, I, I, don't I, know. I may be misrepresenting him, and I hope that Clive will watch. Well, Clive will watch this, I'm sure. Hello, Clive, yeah. uh, and and respond yeah. accordingly. But, but what other... about the signal to investors? Do you think there's a signal to investors? Your camera just moved, then I think. Oh, the camera just moved. The camera is now back on track. Thank you. Well done. That would have been. Yes, yeah. we filming over there somewhere. <laughs> then, it? We'd have still caught you. <laughs> <a> good size. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, there are two other things. Um, first is the, there's the time dimension in there. Well, it goes with this, this question of does it, 
does it um, provide very clear guidance to investors? I think it helps, but not within the, not in relation to the time frame we have to respond not to enough. the challenges. No, nothing like it. And I'm sure Clive must be fully aware of that. Yeah. The time frame we have to respond to two degrees centigrade, let alone one and a half degrees centigrade, is so incredibly tight that I don't think um, you know, the, the, the well-meant words and headlines and strong headline message from, from the Paris Agreement is enough to convert, to, to translate um, what the investors are prepared to invest in at the moment into, into a, um, a, a very low carbon or zero carbon alternative. It's also, there's a presumption there that the investment is really all around the supply side. And the argument that I and other Tyndall Centre colleagues have made for a long time is you cannot deliver two degrees centigrade. I don't think you can need to deliver two and a half degrees. I think you'd be pushing to deliver three degrees if you were simply reliant on transitioning the supply side from high carbon to low or zero carbon. I don't think we have the time frame to, to, to do that. And therefore, unless you're prepared to see massive investment in the demand side, and that's both technical and... Mm, ah, well, this is, this is perfect. This, this segues absolutely brilliantly into oh. the next few questions. So, um, another smart Australian, there seems to be a lot of them.